So we looked at Taylor's theorem and we saw that a key part of that theorem is the error term, right? That Taylor's theorem says that your function is equal to your Taylor polynomial plus some error and that error has a particular form. So what I want to do is look at an example of using a Taylor polynomial and then trying to say that our error has some upper bound, that we know our error is no larger than such and such. So let's let's just use e to the x as an example. Um, so say we use e to the x equals 1 plus um, x plus x squared over 2 factorial as an approximation. So we're using the second order Taylor polynomial there. So say we use this approximation to approximate square root of e. Now, what do we mean by that? So first of all, what is square root of e? Square root of e is e to the half. So what we're wanting to do is evaluate the function e to the x at x equal a half. But since we don't know how to do that, we're instead we're going to evaluate the polynomial And that's our approximation, right? That is not exact. Obviously, we've only used three terms. We'd have to have the entire series to get it exact. But there's our approximation. We could compute that. Um, what is that? That is uh, 1 plus a half plus an eighth. So 13 eighths, I guess. The question then is, Okay, there's an approximation of square root of e. How good is it? How far is that from the exact? Well, obviously we won't know because if we knew how far it was from the exact, we could figure out the exact and then there's no error. So we want to use Taylor's theorem to put some upper bound. We want to know that we're not bigger than some amount of error. So let's remind ourselves of the, what Taylor's theorem says. It says that the error, the nth remainder at b, is the n plus 1 derivative at c over n plus 1 factorial b minus a to the n plus 1. And let's make sure we understand what all the different unknowns in that formula are. So, first of all, what is the function? The function that we're trying to approximate is e to the x. So let's just list all this stuff out so we're clear. The function, e to the x. In this, n represents which order Taylor polynomial you're using. We're going up to x squared, so this is second order. So n in this case is 2. A is where we centered e to the x when we created that Taylor series in the first place. So when we derived the Taylor series for e to the x, sine x, cosine x, all of those were centered at zero, right? So that's what that A is. That's the same A from before. So remember in a Taylor series you have to center it somewhere x minus A, x minus A squared. The a in this case was 0. b is where you'd like to use it. Well, where are we attempting to use this approximation? At x equal a half, right? So b in this case is a half. If we were trying to find e to the fifth power, then b would be 5. Whatever power of e we're trying to find here, because that's what we're plugging in for x, that's our b. And then lastly, remember that c is the mystery value, right? If we knew c, we could just calculate the error and there would be no error. Uh, but the best we can do is bound it. And what Taylor's theorem tells us is that c is somewhere between a and b. 
So all we know about C is that it's somewhere between zero and a half. Okay, so let's fill in everything we know. And then that unknown C, F, the n plus one derivative of F at C, we'll just try and bound that. So let's fill all of our pieces in to the puzzle. Um, so it's R sub n, which in this case is two, R sub two at B, which is a half. So that'd be the notation for it. And we'll just look at error in magnitude. So in its size or in its absolute value. So let's just look at the absolute value. Um, so we want the n plus one derivative. Well, n is two, so the third derivative of e to the x. Well, that's a nice thing about e to the x. Doesn't matter what derivative it is, they're all e to the x. So um, we've got e to the x evaluated at c, right? So that's e to the c. n plus one derivative, two plus one, or, or excuse me, n plus one factorial, so two plus one three factorial, and then b minus a to the n plus one. All right, so no matter what the function was, we would know that number, we would know these numbers, we would know all of this. The only thing that's unknown is this function's n plus one derivative at c. So all we're hoping to do is put an upper bound on that magnitude. So let's separate the stuff we know from the stuff we don't know. That's a half cubed or an eighth. Three factorial is six, so eight times six is 48. So we've got absolute value of e to the c times one over 48. So now my goal is to say, well, what's the biggest e to the c can be given that c can only be somewhere between zero and a half. So let's look at this graphically. Now we don't know much about the particular values of e to the x, but we do know it's an exponential function. So we know it's increasing. And we do know one value there. We know that it's one there. But we're going from x is 0 to x a half. And c is somewhere in between there. So I'm just going to put a mark on there. I don't know what c is. It is some unknown value in between there. So c is unknown. But what do I know about the possible values of e to the c? Well, every one of these points on this curve is less than this point, right? So, and that's e to the half right there. So no matter where c is, the output e to the c is going to be less than e to the half. So that's my upper bound. So at this stage, I know that this quantity is less than e to the half times 1 over 48. So we've bounded our error at this point. But with e to the x, there's an added wrinkle. What was our whole point here? Our whole point was we wanted to approximate e to the half. And we just said that how good is our approximation of e to the half? Well, it's e to the half divided by 48. But what's e to the half? We don't know, right? That was the whole thing that we didn't know in the first place. So I don't want to write my error bound in terms of the thing I don't even know. So what we're going to do is we have to assume that we have some base information about e. Now, if you recall in Calc 1, in our development from the beginning of this text, all we did was define e as the slope of the tangent line. Uh, to an exponential at zero, that was slope one. It was a very vague definition. It didn't tell you what the value of that number was, but it did allow us to derive the derivative formulas. So um, it is possible to prove, at least with what we know right now, that e has to be a number between two and three. So for everything we do from now on, I want us to assume that 
All we know about E is that it's between 2 and 3. If you try and assume that you know more than that, then the question is raised, how do you know that? And we don't really know anything about that value of E as far as the way it's been defined. So what I'd like you to do as a bonus here, as a last step, is don't leave this in terms of E. Since we know E is less than 3, we know that that bound is less than that, or the square root of 3 over 48. So keep in mind from now on, don't assume that you know anything more about E than the fact that it's between 2 and 3. You, know, you may know some decimal places from algebra, but we don't know how we got those decimal places in algebra. Um, and actually, how you get those decimal places is by what we're doing right now. So let's not us get ourselves into a circular argument where we assume we know the thing that we're trying to figure out. So the minimum that we really know is that it's between 2 and 3, and we'll leave it at that. Okay, not all things will have that problem. Not all functions are e to the x, but with e to the x, notice that no matter what the original setup here was, e to, no matter what degree and no matter what value, this is still going to be e to the c. So you're going to have an e in here if the function is e to the x. So just say that it's less than, that e is less than 3. 